All right. Everybody can hear us now. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm Evan Evans, and to my left is Dallas Crane, composer. No, just kidding. Hey, how are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> to his left is Stephen Stratford. Hey, guys. And we got Kyle Juhas at the end there. Hey, everyone. It's great to be here. And uh, so, let's talk about scoring. Uh, I wanted to start with, uh, you had some thoughts we were talking about earlier on Ennio Morricone. Yes. Yes. I, uh, I Honestly, I became familiar more with his work uh, from, like I said, one of his more of his underrated scores uh, for the, uh, the film The Thing, uh, directed by John Carpenter. Mm-hmm. And uh, going back and, and seeing his uh, original kind of uh, rap sheet and seeing all the hugest, you know, some of the biggest uh, compositions from the, you know, from those uh, 70s and such like that, like The Good and the Bad and the Ugly. I had no idea he actually worked on those, and then you know, become becoming more familiar with, wow, this guy was introduced to a film like the thing, that was completely out of his element in a lot of ways, and I feel like when I first heard the score for that film, I just always kind of instantly thought it was oh, it's John Carpenter. John Carpenter did the score because he's also he also does the scores for a lot of his films, and then going back and actually looking through and going, oh no, it was any it was any more uh, uh, more uh, more Morricone. And uh, seeing that and kind of being like, you know, it's such an odd thing for me because I feel like there was this very mutual sort of understanding because it's such a very synth-heavy uh, soundtrack. And that's what John Carpenter really specializes in. That's, that's kind of his, that's just his shtick. And especially, you know, for like a lot of 80s uh, films like that. But I feel like, I feel like Ennio went back and rewatched a lot of John Carpenter's films, like say like uh, Escape from New York, which, you know, John Carpenter did, this, did the soundtrack for that. I feel like he went back and watched those and almost kind of, you know, learned this sort of new aspect and really went back. And I think that's such a, I think it's such a, a quality that you can have as a composer and a writer to be at that level and to still be like, you know, I'm, I'm in something that's out of my comfort zone. I want to go and I want to learn this. You know, I think a lot of people, they get to a certain level and they go, okay, I'm a master class. I don't have to worry about this anymore. I'm, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, going back and reteaching myself or teaching myself something new. I don't, you know, I have my own sound. And, and I feel like he, he, he had no problem with it. I mean, it was, it's such a brilliant score. It, I don't think the film would be the same without it. It has, you know, it, it, it has its tense moments, it has its moments of paranoia, and it has its moments of just full-out, you know, insanity. And he conveyed those so well. And it, it's one of those soundtracks you can listen to. Um, we, we discussed on one of the earlier podcasts where you can literally put the scenes together as you're listening to it. And that's such a great quality. Yeah. And I think that's when you, you really get soundtracks that are just, you know, on, you know released just, just on standalone where they do so well just because you have that quality. So. Yeah. That's a score for me that... Um Maybe it was the same for you. You're talking about the thing. Yes, yes, the thing. Yes, yes. that was one for me. That was, I mean, that just that movie, and it must have been the score as well. You know, really defined, um, like you know what is what is a what is great cinema. You know, because that movie really yes. is not about much. No, it's not exactly <laughs> exactly. There's there's just you know I mean, the wind. You know, yes, just isolation. It's about isolation, and it is. It's about like not. Not much. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Isolation and, and the tension of that, the tension that could arise. And my favorite scene from that film is when they're doing the blood test and they've got oh, everybody strapped yeah. down in the chairs. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's your favorite. And, you know, everybody's waiting their turn to see who's who's the bad guy. And uh, and it turns out, you know, you don't know. That, that That's it. That's the, in a nutshell, that scene is why that movie works. Yes. You yes. don't know who's the thing exactly and there's that great tension there and it, you, you might have missed something it could have been another guy you know you, it's like the, the trick with the with the cups yes you know when you yes. do the, the three cups and you're just like wait where's the ball yes you know and you really are you sure really you know because like oh my god I thought I swore it was underneath that cup you know and then uh, and then lo and behold you know it's somebody you didn't even realize and freaks you out you were sure that guy was not there was no so now you, your whole concept of what is you know what what you expect and what's comfort zone is out the door exactly and and it just keeps going going from there and then you mentioned in your Morricone how his you know it's interesting I think you know John Carpenter a synthesizer composer who often scores his own movies yes goes in makes this film and says to himself actually uh 
you know, I'm not going to score this one. <laughs> yes. yes. Right? I mean, like, that's, in the, A, at base level right there, that's amazing right there. Like, finally, he says, okay, I'm going to try and hire somebody else. Okay, so if you're going to hire a composer, you know, hmm, who am I going to hire? And then he thinks, I don't know how this come about. There's probably some interviews somewhere with it. Maybe some of the audience knows and they can inform us. But, you know, he goes... The guy that did the good, bad, and the ugly. That's who, <laughs> right. Exactly. That's who I want on this exactly. isolated, cold Arctic, Antarctic score. And he gets Ennio Morricone, who's this big orchestral, but very creative composer, and says, "But I want you to use synth." <laughs> so, so it's just this strangest, you know, stringing of events to create. Getting Ennio Morricone on this movie using synth, but but of course Morricone takes the synth and he uses that as kind of a foundational layer, and he creates this this eerie atonality. Yes, it just gives you no bass. Everything's off kilter. There's no up, down, left, right, bottom. Exactly. And and it, and it expands with synths into eventually adding orchestra, and then there are some cues that are full orchestra, and then it. There are some cues that are just like iconically um, bold. Yes. Like horror, some horror moments. You know, he didn't hold back. He didn't do like an effect and let the, you know, the moment play. He went all the way in. Yes. And blast you with with a giant, you know, motif or music. And exactly. Like very bold. And so, you know, I don't think you would have got that with with every composer. I think it was. A very interesting kind of perfect storm of events. Yes. To get to the way that movie came out. Now, now there's a there's a film analysis. I think it's a film theorist on YouTube. His name is Rob Ager. He runs uh, Collative Learning. He's actually talked about um, this movie. He talks about how if you really look, there, there are a few theories actually. Um, like if you look, you can tell who's the thing by like if their eyes are shiny or the yes. You can track the clothing. You see like their breath and like if they actually have a breath when they're outside. Like if they're outside right. the actual you know thigh comb and you can see them talking. And sometimes there was a theory I remember about like the last scene where you have Childs and McCready, and people thought for years like oh there's no breath from, from Childs he's the thing. But yeah, I remember I think I might have seen like the exact same because I remember that analysis. I might have seen that same video where he talks about no you can it's just so faint you can still see it. Um, but yeah. no, it is. It's, I, I think it's. I don't know if I believe that. Yeah, yeah. It's, one of those, it's, it's, it's great video to watch regardless. Those are those kinds of. It could have been a coincidence. Exactly. Those very it's big could be true. stretching yeah. fan theories. But uh, to his credit, Rob Baker is a very good uh, film theorist. So yeah. it's at least you know good to check out. I, th- I think when we're talking about that genre, like horror in general, is uh, to me it's like a game. You know, They set up the film, they set up the rules of the game, and then they play out the game. And of course, it's a scary game, but it, that's what it is. It's rules, and mm. it's a great way to put it. It is. Mm-hmm. So th- that's kind of the fun of it, right? Exactly. Is you, yeah. you get to look at the deeper, darker parts of your soul, but at the same time, because it's in this game format, that's what makes it fun and right. palatable and digestible. I think, too, it's they, they open it up with the, the chess game in the very beginning. And I think that it's just like you said, the whole game it, mm-hmm. and the whole movie is kind of this chess game where everyone's getting knocked off kind of, you know, during certain moments and you're kind of trying to figure out who is who. And it's interesting, too, because during the filming of it, John Carpenter, a lot of times, the actors didn't even know who it was. So they're acting a scene and they're, you know, I think that kind of gave it that genuine, like, I don't even know if I am or not. I don't know if I'm supposed to be the thing, you know? So, <laughs> right. so they're acting, trying not to, you know, I think if you would have told them, they would have been, oh, okay, I have to kind of act more secluded or more in the background or I kind of... And I think it would have, as, as an audience, I think what, just even what Evan mentioned too, you would have been like, oh yeah, well I, I knew that because the way the guy was acting, I knew that, you know, but they, they didn't know. So, you know, until the, that, you know, that scene came up and okay, you were it, you are it, you know, and oh wow, okay. And uh, I do, I think that that really lent a lot of just genuineness to the film. And right. So. What I love about it is that you never, you never really know you never really see the alien until it's like you see glimpses of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and like when the guys what well, there's a scene where I forget I, where the guy's like body turns into like this opens up and it's like a, a giant yeah. mouth and he sticks yeah. his hand oh, and he's Lord. Like, yes. just it's like freaky stuff <laughs> it's like yes, oh my special goodness yeah. it was and I mean it was uh, I can't remember uh, who the actual special effects artist was um, 
Oh boy, I got probably his name wrong. Rob Bettini, I believe it was. It was like twenty three at the time. It was like one oh, of his that right? one of his first you know projects. Yeah. And I remember there's so many scenes where Jack Harper is like, "Can you actually do this?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know? Right. they had so many uh, incidents too, where like the flamethrowers would go off and like this whole area would catch on fire yeah. because it wasn't supposed to. You know, and, <laughs> oh yeah, because they oh, had right. you know, yeah. control. Well, yeah. jelly I can and hear stuff those and dogs and... in my mind right now. Uh, that howling yeah. that uh, you know they caught them on fire and yes. they're. And just that, oh, I mean, yeah. and and I feel like Ennio, like he understood those scenes, right. and he like I remember like yeah when they when they first upon like the dogs in the kennel, and, there's, and everyone's seeing this for the first time. You can see they're just their faces like what is going on, and he captured it because he he had the sound effects, but you could still hear that really dissonant sort of underlying you know just that that score with the very backdrop so you kind of hear it but he's letting all those sound effects because they're because they're they're so important mm-hmm. it's these otherworldly sounds they did such a great job on this right for that film it, it i mean that that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about context yes yes exactly to to have those sounds there is so integral to the storytelling which is completely reliant on the context that they're in Antarctica. Exactly. exactly. So it's like it, you absolutely have to convey at all times that context yes. in order for the story to always be playing against it. Exactly. exactly. That's a really great example. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I, I, honestly, it's, I, that's, it's probably my, my favorite horror movie that and probably 28 Days Later. Very different, but, uh, <laughs> but still I feel like they just... In a way, I, I feel like they are similar in certain regards like you just mentioned with concepts and the way they, the soundtrack plays. Very different soundtracks as well. But there's scenes like 28 Days Later where there's nothing, no, literally no actual audio, and then he'll walk up to a car and the alarm goes off. Uh. And everyone, you know, and th- there was no other way. I feel like they could have shot that scene. They had to have that silence. And then that, boom, you know, and it's... But um, I do, I feel like uh, with certain horror compositions like that, you really are relying on ambient sounds, the actual sound design itself, and then the actual score. And achieving that balance, I think, I think that's where you really get... Uh, yeah, I think, I think balance is key because those those extreme examples where you talk about there's no audio in the film and it kind of blasts out. Those are really specialized yes. instances in films, and I know, especially like younger creators, they always want to go for this you know kind of fringe filmmaking where they get the you know the effect that they want people to talk about right, in lieu right. of actually having a decent film. I, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that that's you've got to you uh, know, know how to work in the middle ground and, and and you know set up this unique sound without resorting to just the uh, the edges and exactly exactly. You, you you made me remember this movie that came out I don't know three years ago called Life I think it was called Life. Yeah. And it was about a bacteria that's like kind of like on the space station oh, yeah. or something. Like, it kind of grows. Yeah, and, and it grows, yeah. and it's like uh, an alien bacteria, so huh. it's kind of a drama strain, yeah, Michael yeah. Crichton inspired or whatever. But um, if you haven't seen the movie, there's like a jaw dropping finale uh, oh. trick that the filmmaker did. Like what you just said, you know? Mm-hmm. The filmmaker actually did something as an auteur with the, with the filmmaking. That, and anyone who's seen the film is, is knows what I'm talking about, but um, it's kind of like a Rod Serling moment, oh, yeah. or yeah, yeah, or, yeah, or maybe yeah, yeah. Black Mirror moment or something mm-hmm. where you you thought something, but it turned out to be uh, the complete opposite uh, because of a little sleight of hand, like a magic trickery of the filmmaking, the way they did it, the editing. Mm-hmm. Um, they played with your your the, your sense of continuity. Uh, right. Uh, okay. Very okay. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. That was a good. Uh, that was a, a decent movie. Yeah. I don't think I've seen that one actually. Oh, I yeah. wanted to though. Yeah, I really wanted. I think it was called Life. Yeah, Life. Yeah. I remember yeah. That. Like Jake yeah. Gyllenhaal. Um, yeah. I remember yeah. the trailers. Yeah, I remember uh, the trailers. Poking right it well. and then it gets mad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, that's really? That's one thing. Yeah, he, like <laughs> you know, grabs his hand. Like, ah, you can't. You, they don't show it though. Uh, off screen. Yeah. I think the beginning. And the end of that movie were great. And the middle was just, you know, let's let it just, you know... Yeah, kind of let it ride out. <laughs> run loose, yes. yeah. Yeah. Another movie like that, uh, I, I don't remember it too well, but it was the one where we have to, like, reboot the sun, and so we send, like, these uh, people to the sun. Yes. Very big... Um, um, Sunshine, I think yeah. it's called? Sunshine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, it's been years I've seen it, but it was yeah. very, well, um, very well done film. Yeah. Yes. Kind of remember like our Vent Horizon, that's another one. It did, yeah, we were, yes. we were just talking about it. <laughs> oh, you were? No way. We were, yeah. Um... <laughs> 
I, I like Sunshine too because it's uh, I like sci-fi films. It reminds me a lot of like 2001 Space Odyssey as well, where it's you, 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 almost that that feeling of isolation, and mm-hmm. you're kind of just on the space station by yourself. So you kind of see everyone kind of go almost go crazy from it. And uh, from what I can remember, yeah, the soundtrack was was very close to that. They really they didn't they didn't go off too kilter. Like you really did feel like you were alone on this. Oh, it, it, it's great because they were they were on a mission to literally save the planet, but at the same time, that like the, just the amount of just isolation was just immense. So it's like in which in two thousand one or in no event in, horizon uh, uh, sunshine sunshine yeah. I yeah. wonder if that was like a narrative technique to kind of set up like this impending sense of if the Earth is destroyed, then it is really going to be isolation. Yeah, right. So exactly. You're kind of you know projecting this feeling of dread it's feeling of dread right it's like like they're they're up there and they're like you know we're, we're doing this mission da, 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 but you can see like the fact that they are so alone they just kind of lose sight of it and it's almost like 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 what are we really doing here and, you, and it just I don't know I, I think it, it added so much more of a psychological element to that film I think I hope people picked up on it and what's the name of that piece that they used in the trailer for that because that was huge the oh, sunshine trailer piece man. and oh. it got used you know they started doing that in every single trailer had a dun 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 Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, <laughs> I know what you mean, though. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. It was great. So it's kind of like what we mentioned last week, but we're talking about the uh, like when when Deadpool came out. Now every single movie that kind of has a, a wisecracking hero has like an '80s hit for like the trailer <laughs> song. Everybody's got it now. Like, oh boy, you know the whole bunch of had that, you know. And yeah. when you're like, yeah, yeah you, you see these, um, I don't know, kind of these waves of influence take over. And everyone's like, that's hot right now. We're doing that, you know? And it doesn't lend itself to the actual um, presentation. It doesn't lend itself to the actual, you know, story itself. But uh, Well, yeah. So that, that, What's that. the one we always do with Journey? Don't Stop Believing. Yeah. That's in a lot of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah, that's, I don't it's know if I've seen that in a film. Um, I don't know if I've seen that in a film or a trailer used like that yet. Oh. Man. Oh, man. I that's a good one, sworn I saw some. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of forgettable at this point. I think that's what it is too. It's like it's like I know I've seen it, but I, I can't remember. Yeah. It. I know it's been in like a billion, but I have, I have no idea. Uh, um, yeah. But no, it's funny when you see trends like that, and you kind of see the way yeah. that they morphed into like into all these other different sort of aspects of you know of entertainment or movies. Yeah. You know, one like one superhero movie will have an idea, and then you know this thriller will take that. This action movie will take that. This drama even might even take that, just to kind of have like a underlying sense of humor you know like I've noticed a lot of you know a lot of dark you know or black comedies have that mm-hmm. um, but uh, but yeah I do I, do. I, I, I think because I, yeah, I remember you watched the trailer for Hellboy and I walked <laughs> in and you were like I just watched it you were right like, it just didn't fit and I'm like yeah. and that's what's popular now but um, I think too it almost goes on what we were talking about in the previous podcast where it was more of like you can do you can follow the wave or you can do these taboo ideas that people 10, 20 years ago would have been like you, you can't do that you can't you know, we mentioned what the hateful like. You can't cut screen and then have your you yourself that are to come on and explain like, what are you talking? You can't do that. You know, but well, even worked. with the music, um, Morricone is really good at, at that, bringing in yes. instruments. Like, you know, the, he he set up his own sound of the western with like these electric guitars and exactly. pipe organ and you know all these weird sounds that that singing lady the kind of indian influence yes and then now with the uh hateful eight he kind of breaks that with the low winds it and just, just kind of grinds it just it you know just, there's no yes, soaring kind yes. of it's like all the birds have died it, it, that's a great way to put it it just yeah. it just it does it just oh. trudges along you know it's <laughs> a, i like that it grinds yeah <laughs> it does you know? wheel or something. just feels like kurt russell's voice to me <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> yeah, yeah it is oh, I can see you put it into the, the midi book. yeah <laughs> like and then the midi spat out yeah break that Guitar, you know, and oh, gosh. tune into music. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, you know about that, right, Steve? Which what, 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 he really broke a, a historical Gibson. I oh, think really? it was. Oh, yeah. I, oh I didn't know that. Oh, oh yeah, wow. there's a scene. Okay. They they have the stand in this borrowed historical guitar on the wall, and then they were supposed to swap it out for the fake for the scene where he breaks it. But they were yeah. just sort of doing a take. But, yeah, and something got mis- mixed up yeah. and they didn't swap it. And they broke the real broke historical the real. Gibson. Oh, oh my wow. gosh. Oh, man. Oh. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wincing really hard on the inside right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. I think gosh. they estimated the value at like quarter mil or something. Oh, yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's, you know, it's historic. It's, it's historic. And that that's point. a priceless thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, Maybe but, uh, you can't get a Japanese collector to pay, you know, <laughs> billion dollars for it but it's irreplaceable <laughs> it, it is at that point I mean that's, I think any musician is going to have that feeling when it comes to an instrument whether it was like something cheap that was owned by someone who became famous 
or there was sort of this like original sort of make of something that was you know this company that became huge. I mean, everybody knows Gibson Fender. You know, even if you don't play guitar, you, you can guess. Right. Like, oh, I know what that is. That's a guitar company, right? Yeah. You know, but um, but yeah. Um, I think that uh, you know Tarantino even used up. Actually, it's funny we mentioned Hateful Eight and. In, and then we were talking about the thing because yeah. I I believe he even used a couple cues. He did, yeah, from the thing. He did. He yeah. in the hateful eight. What? You could see. You yeah. could see. Like he, he was very influenced wow. by that film for that because like the isolation aspect. Yeah. They're all in this, you know, this this lodge tavern. Yeah. You know, he wanted that context. Yes, almost yeah. kind of like who is the snake. And then I realized it was the the guy down underneath in the basement. Oh yeah, but don't tell people. Spoiler alert! I have no respect for. You've spoilers. been living under a rock if you haven't no, seen right. it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah. Uh, you can enjoy it having uh, you know knowing a spoiler. Oh goodness gracious! Yeah, yeah <laughs> but no respect for spoilers. We were talking earlier about how it's so interesting how Quentin Tarantino wrote that movie because yes. he started with 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 no concept. Yeah, just kind of. and he just kind of like in a snail shell well just, way he just kept adding to it and he started writing you know about a guy in a, a horse and buggy you know didn't even matter what, what it was on the way nothing just you know clip clop you know? right <laughs> and then oh they have to stop there's somebody in the road you know and then who is it oh and uh, it's, uh, it's it's this guy he wants a ride because it's cold out you know and so but I don't know you you know and if you have any guns you better throw them over here and so now there's got to be reason to be suspicious and it's got to be reason to be have reserve and so there's it just kept caking on and he kept adding on adding on he meets another guy meets another guy okay then they're at you know what is it haberdashery yeah and um you know and then we meet up with the old guy oh the academy award winning dude like bruce the, Dern, the southern bruce general Dern. or something yes yeah. and like all that kept getting added on and that just shows how much of a master craftsman he is because he got all these sort of improvised elements to actually come together and, and work out together. And, and we were talking earlier about how because that was uh, – he, he, he has a process where he has the actors rehearse everything and then he starts to see like how can I shape this, all oh, that, now that's irrelevant or we need to add this on or we need to connect these dots – and by the end, you have like a, a really great. I mean, I don't think anybody could use that process and and come out as masterfully. Well, it's difficult, even in like animation. You know, you set guide points called keyframes, or you set the strong poses of the character, and then you fill in in between, so that your character model doesn't morph. Right? You know, they don't start out this tall, and by the end of the scene, they're this tall. Right. Right. And there are animations that have that problem, and you know, people notice it really quickly. So. You know, you always do the keyframing, but if you were to just animate frame by frame, you know, a whole movie would just be impossible. Yeah, you, 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 there, there's no way, there's, there's no, like, point of reference you can go back to. Like, yeah, and, and the same, I'm sure, is with writing, with scoring. Yes. Yeah. You know, you can get lost if you don't have that direct focus. We were, we were talking about that in the last, we were talking about variation and how important it is and how it's a kind of use of, like, you get lost and, you know, like, you're writing a new piece for every single scene. And then uh, you mentioning like you know having that variation using that that tool, it, it's it's a great way for you to have literally like a toolbox you can pull from. So you're like, no, I'm now in this scene. I want to go. I want to go back to this motif. What if I use this part? I use this part. I leave these out, and I play in a different key, or you know, it, it crescendos in a different spot, or it, it it constructs and deconstructs, and how that alone gives you a whole other you know kind of list of songwriting tips and tricks that you can use. Where instead of being like you know. I've just composed all these different pieces. Now it's like, it just feels like, oh, it makes the movie almost feel like a big jumbled mess. Now, you know, you're not really sure, like, you know. Um, you you kind of have to sacrifice the sense of, you know, accomplishing some Herculean task. By writing yes. 40 original pieces, you have to get that out of your head. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And think, oh, well, maybe it's not that hard after all. Oh, maybe I, I can really do it. Yeah, yeah. It, you, yeah. Maybe you I can't think, brag about it, but you get a better product. But ex exactly, it's it's that, you know, it. it it's it's a, it might be viewed as like a simpler way of doing it, but yeah, I think I think even in its own regard, it, it could be very complex. Yeah. Knowing how to you know, like we were talking too, just like the the three note variation. It's just building upon that and just using. Wow, well, what if I just play a little bit faster? I change the tempo a little, you know. Oh, there's so much you can yeah. do. So much you can do with it. There's yeah. apps. It's endless. You, it's, know? you know, you know, it was pretty funny. Like Hans Zimmer, I think it was in Batman. Uh, one of the, the there was a cue for Joker, and I think he just there was one note just. He, that's all he had. He that's gets it. one note, and yep. it was like it was on a guitar or cello or whatever. I don't know, and it was really dissonant just, and just. You know, it was like, 
Mm. With one note, that's what you could do. It's just so amazing. Right. Um, you would have never thought. <laughs> and you have composers, you know, uh, many, um, I don't know, uh, uh, composers who are choosing an easier route or something, which I find to be actually the harder route. Um, they try and compose their way out of every situation. Try to compose, mm. you know, into new material, new yes. material, new material. Yes. <laughs> but you know, um, you know, if you if you can figure out how to do uh, something, you know, fifty or a hundred or hundred and fifty different ways, you only have to come up with a few somethings then, exactly. <laughs> and you can cover an entire film. And, and that's the whole concept behind behind like motivic de- development, you know, versus through composing. And uh, you know, people like Howard Shore and Jerry Goldsmith. Are sort of masters of that um, motivic approach, right? It's it's not just a straight repetition. There's some nuance and control. Um, you know, w- when you're crafting this stuff to shape it, make it make it interesting yet relate relatable and fit the narrative, mm-hmm. right? It's not just a you know reuse, you know, copy paste kind of thing either. Right, 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 right. It's a very yeah. fine balance. Whenever, experience. whenever you're repeating the same concept again, it becomes like a, a loop. It sounds like a record loop or something. Yes. You know? mm-hmm. And it's just tired the second time, you know, and tired the third time and right. tired the fourth <laughs> time. You know, so I don't know that, um, you know, that's a sustainable. I think audience. I think audiences are tired of that yes. method, you know. And, you know, you look at um, Lord of the Rings and... You know, Howard Shore's contribution was no small bit (laughs) to that uh, movie and probably had something to do with how successful it was. You know, I don't know what percentage, but a good percentage, you know. Everybody did the right, you know, everybody did the right thing on that. So, you know, I don't know why we've got this like Marvel train wreck going on or, you know, this studio, studio film train wreck going on where... Um, nobody can can do anything except you know just their job right, you know, right. and no churn way. out this wallpaper and okay there you go thanks you know and, and then try it not to have any kind of like any kind of issues I, it's a big debate you know well yeah it's it's it has to do with the tastes of the global market you have to find something that you know China is going to allow into their markets and that th- those people are going to want to watch and then you've got you know, probably India, and then the European market, and then U.S. domestic market. You, know, you have to find something that everybody can relate to. And you have to leave out the parts that might offend some of the people or might not make as much sense. Right? right. You, you now you can't assume that people will understand that the narrative is going a certain way, and so you get a lot more, you know, kind of explicit um, exposition. You know, a lot clearer, and then obviously too many cooks in the kitchen kind of thing going on where, you know, everybody's working on this myopic thing and then you zoom out and suddenly it's, you know, where where's the vision, where's the the individual guiding this? Right, and, and goes they're back. relying on that formula too, I think. They're just like, okay, we've got this formula. Right. We need to apply it in everything we do. And, exactly. you know, that's going to make us money or whatever. And it's right in and just way. Yeah, to the credit, it's very successful. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's money. Right. Sure. I think it's interesting to you brought up the fact that you have to um, you have to think about all these different global demographics and mm-hmm. how is it going to translate, you know? And I think it's something people don't they don't think about, you know? It's like, like you know, it's like I wouldn't even think about like, oh, how is this going to how is this going to do in India? You know, like are they going to pick up on these cues? Are they going to pick up on, you know, on this are they going to understand what this, you know, if you're using whether you like you licensed a song or you wrote something, you know, that we're more used to kind of just an American audience like are they going to understand this in a way? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it is. It's it's it's, a, it's an interesting sort of concept you have to tackle, and you have to really think about: is this going to be profitable, not just here but everywhere? You know, like if we're mm-hmm. doing global distribution, is it going to work? You know? Right, and especially with those large IPs, you really rely on fans and resale, right? So the, yes, I'm, I'm assuming that you know the fans in each country have different flags that they rally around. You know, right. so Star Wars yeah. fans in you know the U.S. might want something out of Star Wars that is different than. You know, elsewhere in the world, but you still got to market to both. Exactly. Or else you're gonna lose one of them. Mm. You yeah. notice that a lot with I think like even like just going really outside like cover art for either movies or games. You'll always notice it's a little different like between like the European or like Jap- you know Japanese or American oh, movies. Yeah. And it's always funny like I always notice like European if it's like a European video game cover I, I always enjoy it much more because the American cover is always very typical. It shows the character. If it's like an action game, they have, they have their gun. 
and that's it. Like that's yeah. it's just like it's a close up oh, shot yeah. of them with the, you know, and that and that it's it's you know you you you, you kind of notice like that's what I guess that's just what the American demographic likes. They like seeing that. Yeah, I think I remember uh, it was Kirby and everything with Kirby and Japan was like cutesy and fun, and then you get to the states and. They, they make Kirby's face all angry. Yeah, he's angry. Kirby's like, right, it, you right. know, he's always has, like, the sword, like, something like that. Like, he's always, like, attacking something. <laughs> yeah. and it is, it's, it's true. Yeah, yeah it's, it's absolutely true. Um, I don't know that uh, that it's a successful formula every time, though. Yeah. Because, like, let's think about, what was the one with the machines, Peter Jackson's recent release? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, poured Infernal everything into something. that. No, it's Mortal no, Engines. Mortal, Mortal, Mortal Engines. Engines. That's it. Yeah. yeah, they poured so much money into that, and I think it only made, I think, uh, it, I'd be lucky if it, if if I was correct on that fact that it made as much as fifteen million dollars. Wow! Yeah. yeah, I think it only made like a million and a half or something. It wow. was just a total failure. But then they keep applying the formula. They keep applying the formula, and it's not working. And and you know what was the one um, Justice League total failure? Oh, okay, yeah. I think of uh, the one with the Suicide Squad also did not do too the well. The yeah. DC universe is you know, but then all of a sudden Aquaman is this huge one point two billion dollar success. Yep. You know, right. like you know, so I don't know. It's the formula. Formula. I don't know if the formula is really successful always. The Aquaman formula is different than the rest of uh, Justice League and all of those. It's this. I call it like this super tentpole. We're now. You know, as a tentpole film, it used to be like everyone would go and it'd cover everything. Now it's like multiple genres of film in one film. You know, Aquaman at some point it was like this spy sleuth, and then a romantic comedy, and then this sci fi thing, and then this fantasy thing. And mm. I swear it was like eight different movies, and you're just like you know, going through a YouTube playlist. And <laughs> point, 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 point. It really was. That's, yeah, a, that's, that's a like a it. super tentpole because, you know, they, they just have to cover Why was that so enjoyable? Well, I just laughed at the whole movie because it was a joke. <laughs> Well, everybody but, loved it. One, to the yeah. tune of one point two I mean, billion. To its credit, I saw it and I wanted to see Mortal Engines, and I didn't see Mortal Engines, so Aquaman yeah. beat at least so, one right. of me anyway. Mm. Do you think that was marketing then? Uh, yeah, it was a few different things, but I didn't. I didn't really notice some compelling reason I wanted to see Mortal Engines. Maybe it was because they were focusing on the materialistic aspect of it instead of some human aspect. That's how I felt. I felt like they, like it's like you said, they poured so much into the like production quality of it. It would like even watching the commercial, you're like, what is this going to be about? I feel this is going to be like almost like a like a, just a different take on like Mad Max in a way. Yeah, it's like giant like Mad Max. Like who yeah. are the characters? Yeah, like, exactly. Like I, I didn't get a feel for it, you know. And I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love Peter Jackson's work and such, but I, I feel like it was. It was one of those things where it's like they tried that same tested formula thinking it was going to work and it flopped and I remember I've seen film reviews of that movie you know I, I haven't seen it myself but people saying almost the exact same thing like there's no memorable characters they're just kind of throwing all these effects and these crazy scores or these you know big big huge scenes they're just throwing everything at you and I feel like a lot of that is a lot of movies nowadays they just kind of throw things at you so it kind of always keeps you a little off guard in a way even though it's a story you've probably heard or seen a mm -hmm. billion times um I mean, I even noticed that when, like, when he, he did the Hobbit trilogy, like, I, I don't get me wrong, I, I really enjoyed those films. I thought that was a great extension of The Lord of the Rings, but at the same time, like, he really jumped on the, obviously, the CG kind of band, and that's a whole different discussion. The children's stories. Yeah. Aspect. And, it, I mean, it, it was, like, Hobbit was, I mean, it was more of a, it was, it was a, more of a fairy tale, whereas Lord of the Rings was more of his take on, like, his experience in World War One, you know, and his... They're actually making. I think I just saw a trailer for Tolkien. They're going to talk. It's about him being in the you know war and how he came up with the story, and it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I'm actually really interested to see that. But um, but no, it, it I feel like he relied a little bit too heavily on certain on certain CG aspects to kind of tell this fairy tale. Whereas Lord of the Rings, yes. it, it, it you still got that sense, but at the same time, like watching that film, like you're 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 on the edge of your seat because it's so tense and and it's very dark in so many ways and. I mean, by the end of the film, like, I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen it, so there's, there's no spoilers here, but I mean, like, <laughs> Frodo goes off, you know, into, into the, you know, into the end, and, and basically is like, I'm, I'm going to go die, you know, that's kind of what, that's what I got from that, goes to live with the elves, and right. he has this wound that never healed, and he always, you know, always looked kind of sickly after he got that, and I, I think that, that kind of attention detail is what really made those films, and there's so many aspects of why those films are so popular, but, like, those kind of attentions, that kind of attention to detail was just very, very great for me. And I feel like they kind of lost a little bit of that in The Hobbit with, you know, or fighting on rooftops, there's a dragon, you know, and it just kind of was like, yeah, like, we, we know that's happening, but... Well, yeah, didn't well, the, the dragon die, like, 
pretty early on or something yeah, like it was, that. It, it was, was like the beginning of the third. I think yeah, the, of the third or the third act or the third film. The you know because he, he had to split a trilogy. Yeah. But uh, it was the yeah like the very beginning and you're like yeah. why didn't we do this at the very end of the second <laughs> film? It just felt very like because they built this whole thing up and then it ends yeah. and you're like. Really? Like, I mean, going back to what we were talking about uh, pre- earlier today, mm-hmm. though, context. Yes. Context yes. wise, right? I mean, how much context is there to play off of the dragon? Right. right. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what's that going to, how much does that change, you know, everyone's, you know, relationship to the total overall story, you know? So, you know, I think that, like you said, there was just way too much reliance on all the little details mm-hmm. yes. and there wasn't really a bigger context yes exactly yeah, whereas exactly. Lord of the Rings was like look this is the freaking map of the entire yeah. thing they gotta go from here to there that's it can I tell you a story and then and, and yeah. that's so compelling because they've created a great a grand context yes that you can have them just walking through some woods for a while and you're still totally enthralled. Exactly. Because that's playing against that larger context. Yes. I don't think there was much con- large, grand context yeah. in The Hobbit. That's a great it, way to put it, too. Yeah. It is. Putting those small, those very small, intimate human scenes into this grandiose, you know, like you said, like this grandiose layout. You know, mm-hmm. this is huge war. Everyone, you know, and it's just them right. in the woods talking about making, you know, soup or something like that. Right. Like, but you, you, you felt so much more connected those yeah. characters, you know, because it just it lended to the whole story. You itself. set up, you set up this big, yes, well, this big yeah. framework. When, when people watch movies, they want something to take home with them, right? You know, because movies, you you watch a movie and you see yourself in the movie, and so you know if the film has nothing to offer you, if it's you know just a bunch of spectacle and and flash and you know bright lights, there's there's not much to take home, and there's not much that people we will be drawn to. They don't. You know, without that, the uh, the technical side of the art doesn't really matter. Exactly. But with Lord of the Rings, you know, people have these different conversations. You know, they t- they do talk about soup in real life, or you know, they everybody's on their own little journey, and yeah. you know, they have different people that they know who may fit certain aspects, or they may have things about themselves that they relate to the different characters. Exactly. I mean, how many That's, times do you, you yeah. have that conversation with your friends who are like, you would be so and so, I you know, I'd be Sam, you'd be you know, <laughs> Mary. You know, it's true. <laughs> you know, it is like yeah. it. it, it or you, you know, you be Aragorn, or and it does it. it. It's it's people really. I think that's probably why Mortal Engines, for just an example. I think that's why they didn't do so well. Just from what I've heard, yeah, there wasn't anything really in there like that. There mm-hmm. was no. You couldn't really grab on to anything where you felt like you were in there. You felt like you were you know part of the cast. Or you felt like you could take it home with you. It was just. It just was that. Here you go. You know. You just just. I think it. I think it's more yeah. of that experience type film. And it's like you said. How how can you? After forty five minutes, you're like kind of, you know, twitching in your seat and kind of, like, shifting <laughs> right. a lot. And like, when, when, when is it going to be for me? Yeah, yes. I thought it was interesting how you mentioned, like, World War I. Um, and I didn't know that about the author, but it's, mm-hmm. it really, I could see how, like, it affected the whole world. Like, all every country was involved in yep. this war. And now that you're mentioning it, I see it, like, in Lord of the Rings. Like, everyone possible from all over this exactly. universe was, like, involved in this huge thing. And... And it was like, yeah, it's it's so powerful. I mean, he, yeah. he, he said a bunch yeah. of tropes. He he established the, um, what is it like the traveling posse kind of trope, yeah. where a bunch of characters, you know, with each with unique individualized skills, travels together. That's kind mm. of a sci-fi thing that drew from Tolkien. Yes, exactly. And then of course he wrote the story based on the idea that he was a linguist and he developed languages. And he wanted this kind of linguistic evolution, and then he attached events and characters to motivate those linguistic changes that he wanted to explore. That's I was, I was going to mention that too. I mean, the fact that he was able to create create his own languages and create this very rich backstory. I mean, the man was brilliant, a brilliant yeah. author. I mean, you can you know you can stick your nose, oh you know, fairy tale. No, the, the man created a literally created a whole entire world um, with mythos and with lush backstory and just and with characters. Like I said, I mean, you know. Who's gonna really identify with with a with a wizard? And then, but you but you did, you know. I mean that whether it's the film or the or the book itself, you 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 know. I think even just with like Bilbo or Frodo, when you're talking about the Hobbit or uh, Lord of the Rings, everyone identifies with that character. You just you 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 everyone's felt that same fear, or that same uncomfortableness, or that same I'm thrust in a situation where I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And it yeah, it just it just I don't know. 
it's, it's and it's one of those few movies that like you can you can watch over and over again. It's like you're always gonna see something new. Like I found myself going That's back true. and back Absolutely. each time seeing something it, new. It's fun to decode the uh, the Elvish script. Oh, it's like it's actually kind very of, accurate. It's it, it's it's insane to me. How, like I said, how they were they did such a, he did such a great translation with, with including that and kind of being like, oh yeah, you know, all wow. those letters match. Like they didn't change it up. You know, it's the exact same well, they thing. They didn't fake it either. Yeah, yeah they didn't fake, exactly. Mark Gosney says, uh, "Hey, Mark. By the way, uh, hey, Mark. Mark Gosney says that there's not much creative filmmaking going on out there right now, like Lord of the Rings, or maybe he's just too busy with school right now, but he doesn't really know about it, but." He says, whatever the formula, I think the DC Marvel comic genre will run its course. And then what? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure I agree. When, when people say, you know, there's not so much creativity going on, or there's not good music anymore, or what's the definition of our era, you know, stuff like mm-hmm. that. And that's, I think that's, um, I don't know if it's necessarily accurate, and there's a little bit of a, an experiential bias in that, as we live, we see 100% of what is going on right now, the good and the bad, whereas we look back on these older, you know, generations and we choose to reflect on only the good, you know, the interesting, you know, 7% that was going on, you know, you don't listen to like this Electro Raga stuff from the 70s and try and pretend that's the 70s, you know, you go for the, the disco. And exactly, stuff. you go for, yeah, you go for Let's Up, you go for the rock aspect. Mm-hmm. but I think yeah. it's true, I think... Nowadays, it's it's this weird contrast where you have it's there's so many different things out there for people to be into. There's so many different avenues, mm-hmm. and it's like you have to kind of find it yourself. You know, it's very easy to go, man. There's nothing good being made. There's no original ideas anymore. And then you find this avant-garde random filmmaker on Netflix or whatever, or even on YouTube, and you're like, oh, I, I identify with this. I love this. This this could only be made in my era, like my generation. And I think we're we're living in that time now where it's it's incredible. I hear the same thing with, with music. It's incredibly exciting that you can you can go on and you can find. I mean, literally to the to the sub 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 genre of something that you would never have thought you would like, but then it just it just it just totally engrosses you. It just it yeah. just encapsulates well, you. You, you got to think too beyond the medium because I guess as an audience member, you know, there are certain things that you're looking for in the art. And it's not necessarily what the artist is doing, but it's the message the artist is conveying. And so you kind of have to open yourself up to going beyond just that genre and, and finding out that there are other genres that may have that you know artistic message that you're looking for. Right. You know, like right. I'm I'm a big fan of this um, vapor aesthetic band right now named Carpool Party. Oh. Okay. And they're kind of like this kitschy Japanese thing, and they do this whole you know VR environment and. Um, electronic and pop and That's stuff, really cool. but the uh, the undertone is also, you know, kind of dark and punk. I like that. And it, oh, it's awesome. very it's very deep, but it's it's awesome. And you know, mm-hmm. like if you if you're only open to you know like grunge or metal or something, you know, you might miss out on you're something miss out. like that. Exactly. So it, it's beyond the medium, I think, at this point. Yes. I how did how did the uh, music score work in Bandersnatch? Um. I don't. I don't remember anything particularly interesting about it. Okay. And I assume it was just um, hmm. designed scene by scene because I don't think there's an intensive audio engine managing the yeah. you know, soundtrack. But certainly, Bandersnatch itself was a a new way of bringing narrative storytelling. You, you know, it's funny. To it's, the audience. Um, it was like six months before Bandersnatch came out. I was going through Netflix and I found I think it was the Minecraft make your own adventure oh, game oh, oh, and it's okay. it's like Bandersnatch you know you choose the left and right but it's it's kind of like dumb <laughs> you know, so I didn't really take it seriously and then you wow. watch Bandersnatch and they, they do the meta kind of commentary and the story's really deep and they have the twisted am- avenues and everything and I think what was unique about them that really set it apart was you would go through a trail and then when you looped back it would kind of fast forward you through so it wasn't a true loop you know, mm-hmm. you didn't have to make those decisions again. Mm-hmm. But also, sometimes you would loop back and you'd be presented with new options. So it's not this one timeline going on. Mm-hmm. It's it's actually embracing this multiple varied timeline of, like, what if. And, wow. You know, so there's never any true endings like it, you would get. Yeah, but, I, I mean, to me, it almost felt like a game at some point. It left the mo- the, 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 the like the movie aspect, and it was like, now I'm in a game. Let's see. Mm-hmm. It was like a weird combination of the two. Uh, and that worked really well. I don't. Yeah, it seems like more. We're gonna hear more about that, and we're gonna see more, 
movies like that. I'm sure. There's can, gonna, yeah. Can you imagine uh, when the AI gets really good to replicate actors that they could just exactly you know create yeah. thousands or they they could even do like what they do with Minecraft is every time you play the game it has this uh, procedurally generated oh, yeah. environment oh, yeah. that has never existed before. So when you play the game, they could procedurally, procedurally generate, generate the story situations elements. and story totally. elements. I was already thinking that. Yeah, yeah that kind of reminds me of the Ender's Game, you know, kind of thing. Uh -huh. playing. Oh, okay. In a way, this is, I could totally see that happening. About like I don't know, way back in the day, they had like on a CD-ROM there was a game with Rob Schneider, the actor. It's called Fork in a Fork in the Tail, but it's the same concept. Like he was this guy, and you pick his actions. Was on PC, and you could like you're in this fairy tale land, and I I don't know, but you can decide what to do, and like you would punch some guy, and then like <laughs> knock him out, and then you would go into this room, and like you watch out for the guard, like don't go over there, and yeah. it was it was now that I think about it, that was like. 1995 back yeah. then they had it on like PC so but it's similar it's, to like I mean that's the way a lot of adventure games were right event yeah. yes yeah, yeah. yeah. back in that time what yeah. about that one with where it was like yeah. a hand drawn cell animation and you're the knight in the castle going knight to fight the oh, dragon oh dragon's lair dragon's lair yes. Yes. oh yeah yes. Yes. that's yep. it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah oh god that's one of my favorites yeah. yes ace so they were doing yeah there's the name of the guy I, I think uh, if we're talking like future trends yeah. I could see, you know, everybody's familiar with virtual reality, and even children are growing up with the concept. So I'm going to see, I'm I'm expecting to see narratives that expand our sense of reality. Right? We're going to have situations that aren't necessarily rooted in our understanding of physics. You could have, um, mm -hmm. uh, what is it? It's like with with VR, they 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 can double up kind of nonlinear storytelling. Yeah, they have nonlinear storytelling, mm -hmm. but also you can walk in a room and you can walk around. And then suddenly there's a different part of the room present. Like you have multiple, mm. like gotcha. multiple things sharing the same point of space. Mm -hmm. I forget. It's it's not non. Like non I think it's non-Euclidean geometry. Yeah, it's Escherian. Yeah, it's Escherian. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but can you imagine your know, stories that rely on that? Not just for like the trick group, but actually have that yeah. embedded in the conceptual. Right, stage right, of, right. There's a movie the kind of just, like that back in the days called Jacob's Ladder. And, um, well, I guess I won't give it away, but, um, you know, the movie is a trip. Nothing adds up. Things lead oh, to yeah, moments yeah, yeah. that you don't understand. And it turns out um, there's, like, backstory to it all. Kind of like, essentially, you know, it's like all an acid trip in a way. And, yeah, you could, you could definitely, I mean, you could definitely have narrative experiences that are nonlinear. Right. You you know there'll be other things i i'm i'm curious if um like score notation will ever come into the three dimensions you know like instead of mm -hmm. just writing on paper maybe they'll figure out how to write in 3d oh, oh wow <laughs> so like, it's totally, like minority report type stuff <laughs> like, just yeah, like, yeah. You know. yeah except you know nobody sees through the back of the screen oh man so i thought that was silly it's but like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah totally with the the hands we just got one of these the other day so nice. I'll be seeing you guys on the other side <laughs> in the future here. That's awesome. And um, we are actually, I should say that we are going to start doing some weekly meetups in VR. And uh, eventually we're going to be doing some master classes in VR. And you don't have to have, you know, a VR headset in order to participate. You can. Uh, just watch and participate from your desktop, whether it's a PC or a Mac, or whether you're using your Android phone or an iOS phone. Um, but if you do have something like a Gear VR or an Oculus or, or I don't know, if you got your hands on Magic Leap, then get on in there and you want to make sure to follow us uh, in, in VR. Um, we're going to be doing some very cool stuff in VR and, and hope to see you there and get to know you better in VR. Hmm, that's that awesome. awesome. Such a great idea. Such yeah. a great concept, too. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy good, man. Which one is this? This is the Oculus Go. Oh, okay. I've, I've, I've done stuff with the uh, HTC Vive. Uh-huh. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, pretty cool. It's nice that it's uh, wireless, right? I feel like that'll be like the next step. It is. It's totally wireless. It's totally self-contained. Awesome. Yeah. That was the worst with the, the Vive. You had the big cable. It's very thing. high resolution. It's uh, about half the resolution you'd want it to be, uh, ultimately. So that's right. very good for an introductory like VR yeah. experience. Yeah, typically you want it to run at like what ninety six frames per second. Um, and yeah, and this one runs at I think uh, ninety. I'm gonna need my glasses for this. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uses uh, yeah. gives you enough space for glasses if you wear glasses. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, it's very good resolution. Oh, it's been a while since I played VR. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's like my, my thing. See you later, guys. <laughs> All right, well, bye, Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> as this, uh, this is the button here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the trigger. But in any event, yeah, it's, it's uh, technology is moving yeah. so fast. You know, I think it's even too late now to become a YouTuber. You know, it's like that, that gold rush. That. Yeah. Is all gone now. Right. Yeah, it what took about I think about there was a three year gold rush of it. Yes. Yeah. But you know, guys like Casey and I that have been on there about ten years. So yeah. it was about seven years prior to that. You're building up he he built up like a thousand followers in that time. So Yeah. Um here yeah. Is, you wanna take a look, Steve? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. With YouTube's pretty crazy. You know, I I think I was reading something about the incomes oh, wow. of even the top YouTubers is like hovering around minimum wage mm -hmm. you know until you get to the very very top slim top yeah. but those guys had already been in you know so the new ones coming in you know even having a million followers isn't enough anymore to, to be sustainable yeah I mean um, it was Dan Locke that said that you know like trying to make money on YouTube is sort of like trying to pick up pennies in front of a steamroller <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know either you are the steamroller or it's just kind of like really difficult to try and make money on the platform. Um, but you know, the right ways to make money on the platform are to uh, monetize your influence instead of, yeah. say, uh, trying to get ad revenue. Exactly. Right. It's, I was gonna bring that up too. Offer yeah. a, a larger experience than just the YouTube. Get yeah. those, you know, get people involved in your. You know, yeah. business and systems right. and products. Well, I think I, I've noticed every YouTuber now, they have a Kickstarter Patreon. Like, every single one, you know, it's, you know, so I think that was kind of a shift I noticed um, pretty early on, like, when YouTube started changing their, their kind of their whole demographic or their whole uh, algorithm, um, where it was like, you know, I mean, hey, I also have this channel on this, I have this, this, you know, there's my Patreon, da da da, da. And I do, I think it's, you're, you're more monetizing on your actual influence as opposed to just your YouTube presence, which, you know, we're seeing right. back in the day. I think that's, you know, that's like the technical way to see it. I think even just generally is you like doing stuff and you want to hang out with people who like doing that stuff. And then instead of just having them watch you, you have to get them involved in right, helping right. you do that stuff. I think that's why, like, the gaming channels on Twitch, where it's literally just some guy playing a video game. But like that, I mean, you have like a million people watching. It's just because people they, they they like being involved. They can comment. It's like they're right there with mm -hmm. you. You know, I think there's a yeah. Technology is changing so fast. You yes. know, it's and insane now. Even like just YouTube's just are even just watching a YouTube or watching a two D video, yeah. watching a two D planar wow. linear video. Um, is going to seem incredibly old school to the next generation, you know, that's growing up right now. You know, a 20 year old right now is, yeah. why, why would you go sit at a movie theater and watch yeah. this giant, you know, plane? It just doesn't, it's, it's so horse and buggy to them. <laughs> it's like you don't even need to leave your house, you know. Yeah, and, and now you know with VR, yeah, you don't. I mean, you just yeah. need a padded room with like an infinity, an infinity uh, treadmill floor, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man. And uh, and and you can go anywhere. You can join anybody now. You know. I think I think one of the things that was underestimated by the general public was the whole social, the social impact of social networking. Yeah, you know. Well, I think what's interesting is, as you know, we live in a. Kyle, you can check it out. If you like. Oh, I did. I did. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's awesome. We, oh, we it's live awesome. in a country with a lot of abundance and continuing abundance, and so I think, I was I was reading this uh, multimedia web comment called uh, "Football One Seven Seven Six Six that kind of discusses this in a really fun way. But the idea is, you know, as abundance you know, grows and grows and we have more access to more and more things, mm -hmm. the value of those things is going to go beyond just being able to have them, but actually having items with a history behind them, you know. So it's, say you're in a Star Trek universe and you have this um, oh. you know, laser <laughs> thing that can create whatever you want at will. Those mm -hmm. items are going to be worthless, but man, if you have something for the 1700s, that's the real deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be yeah, the real right. value is that, the nostalgia. Steve, does that, that totally history. remind you of Demolition Man? Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. the future, like, it's, it's like 30 years in the future from 
the 80s or 50 years or whatever. Now it would be yeah. the equivalent of like 2070 or something. And um, they get in the car and they turn on the radio and like and what they like to listen to. It's really funny. What they like to listen to is is just is jingles. Commercials from like oh, yeah. commercial. That's the mainstream well, I mean, listening. That's, that's vaporwave. That's like nineties. <laughs> you know. It's awesome, and they're they're really into like eighties nostalgia. You know, they drive like a to drive a Mustang is like you know you'd be the an old like sixty year old like Mustang from nineteen eighty would they, be like you'd be the highest you know rich citizen. You know, the museums were kind of cool too. They had all that oh, yeah. modern stuff like in the museum. Oh yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. You go to the museum, they have like all the historical objects. They yeah. Yeah, it, historical objects have like higher value in the future. Yes. Oh, yeah, totally. That film's a really good example of like you, you take something as like as, as like a nineties action movie, but you add all these little kind of almost kooky elements to it. Mm. And it really did lend itself to where you, know, you can actually have like a, a, a decent discussion about it, you know, where it's not just like, Oh yeah, you remember when Sylvester Stallone kicked, you know, so and so in the head? Like, yeah, it was great, you know. Like there's so much more you can expand upon that, just like talking about like when I think we talked about it. I think it was last week. Where like they, they go to Taco Bell and it's like this. Oh, yeah. thing, It's like this huge restaurant. And, like it's like it's like a fan. Oh yeah, they won like the a, restaurant wars. Yeah, <laughs> and it just. I mean, I, I think there was that they did. They added so many little kind of funny perks and backstory to it, where it was it was very tongue in cheek humor, but it was also just right in your face. Um, but yeah, no, I do. I think that was uh, it is it's one of those films where mm-hmm. it, it kind of gets lost in like the. Stallone library of you know he kicks this guy but um, you know <laughs> it is it, it I think it, it, I think there's certain even like um oh what's another one like that I think even like Judge Dredd had a little bit of Judge that Dredd, in there yeah um, where it was just a little more of a social sort of like context they talked about more social issues than than what you would even like kind of really, like I see Rob Reiner but I'm getting this feeling of like Schneider it's Rob yeah Rob, yeah, yeah, yeah Rob uh, uh, Schneider like but I'm getting this feeling of like you know op- op- oppression and just you know, overlord and this very dark sort of, you know, um, almost uh, like Orwellian society. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that, you know, definitely, mm. you, know, you can always, you can always find, if, if, it's, if it's well done, you can always find something uh, like a very important aspect in the movie or a very, almost like a unique idea in something that's very commercialized, like, you know, an action film. So, but. I have a question here from JJ Berthume. Hey, yeah. JJ. Um, it's a bit lengthy. He says, I have a question. Uh, to what extent do you think the established film genres, comedy, drama, horror, are manifestations of the archetypal experience of the collective unconscious and evolved into categories naturally and inevitably? If so, is there then a danger that film plots original details will be subsumed by the cookie cutter tendency of films to retell the same story how does one strike the balance musically and cinematically between original plot points that are fresh enough to pierce past our desensitization of cliches but not so original that it becomes unrelatable and not representative of the human experience do any of you have a particular favorite film that strikes the balance just right? Yes, Vertigo. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Vertigo yeah. by Alfred Hitchcock. That's okay. a great one. And yeah. and and what you said, Jay, is totally true. Um, movies are that archetypal experience. That's why we go to movies to seek out that our our thirst and our hunger for lessons to learn about life and how uh, basically is fear of death. Carl Jung. Um, would say that we like to experience narrative because we fear death and narratives teach us little nuggets about life and how to survive. It's a survival instinct. So it's our instinct to actually um, seek out these stories that have some kind of a relevance in some way. Even though it's, you know, it might be but a monster that conquers this other thing or whatever, but it's, you know, it might that might just be about you just you know trying to go get your cup of coffee that day and mm-hmm. you, you're really upset about it you know what I mean right. <laughs> these these things have archetypal resonance to us so um, but yeah for me I think that a good movie that balances sort of originality mm. not being cliche and yet kind of telling something that's you know pretty much a simple story that's kind of a human archetype and it's been told over and over is, is Vertigo. That's a good example. Yeah. Or or maybe Braveheart or Avatar, you know, those yes. follow, you know, those kinds of things. I think they were done really well and really richly. I think um, District 9 for me was one of those ones mm. that really had a great mix. And it came out of left field. I mean, that film, 
Like, I was on the edge of my seat and, like, kind of, like, twitchy because I was just so engrossed. Because that's one of those movies where you literally had no idea what was going to happen next. Like, it almost followed kind of this sci-fi sort of trope, but it, it just had so many, like, there was there was black comedy in there. There was very, very hard <laughs> drama. It was a sci-fi. It was an action. Um, you know, it was it was a lot of, it was so many different things. It was almost like a psychological, you see this guy, who, who anybody could put themselves in his shoes. I think I have a better ending for that, by the way. A better ending for District Nine. Oh, the ending. Okay, oh. Re- check this yeah. out. Check this out. So remember when he's he's ripping open the aluminum and he's yes. making a little flower, little flower or whatever. Wife, yep. Okay, let's change that. What if it was you know we cut back to him? Okay, that was we cut back to him, and he's making a little flower with the thing. I don't know. He's just still connected to his love or whatever. Why not do this? Why not cut back to him, and and maybe he's cold, so he's got like a robe on, oh. and it's like really kind of like tattered and everything. Yeah, yeah. And all the other like insect creatures are sort of like following him as he like walks around. Oh, okay. okay. And it's like, bam! You want to go see District Ten now because mm. this guy is going to be like their messiah. I was just thinking, I was the uh, messiah. Yes, the first one popped in my head. Exactly. Was the messiah, you know? I think they missed the beat there at that ending. I think that was the super ending. As a matter of fact, I think it was kind of like so obvious that they probably did shoot it. Maybe they tested it and they went with the one they, they went be. with. Yeah. But I think that's a pretty obvious. If you look at um, Alita: Battle Angel, the new one, that's kind of the idea. Is I didn't you know, see she's that the one yet, from yeah. above who comes down and kind of fights everybody. Mm-hmm. It looks really good. I want it, it seems similar to uh, District 90. Yeah, it does a little but bit. I, kind of I was going to say, with the, I think, JJ, you have some assumptions that I, w- I would challenge. I think um, derivative story points aren't necessarily unimaginative or untruthful to the experience. I think, um, you know, the, sto- the, the myth of the hero with a thousand faces the idea that nothing is new under the sun. Right. A lot of ideas, you know, pe- if, if you look at, like, uh, graffiti back in, like, Vesuvius, they're writing the same stuff that people are writing today. You know, so the idea that narrative recycles is, I think, a good thing and something that should be embraced. Now, what, what should be changed and what should be chased after by um, creators is finding a way to express that narrative in a more truthful and connective way. So maybe the audience has changed but they still need the same message. So you find mm. different, you know, uh, tricks, different media to get that message through to them. You know, right. so back back in the day, you know, we couldn't use images of technology and computers to do anything but exhibit wonder and, you know, this sci-fi thing to the, the people who had no experience with them. But now that they're commonplace, that concept of technology can be used for you know other things for happy for drama for romance whatever right, right. so it's I think there's an experience that's always going to be repeating and the uh, the idea that you know we need to be fresh is not necessarily true except for the fact that the audience has different needs for what needs to be um, used to relate that message to them right, right. I think I they, think that the reason why recycling works is because people don't know all those old stories. They didn't watch, all, they haven't seen yeah. those operas by Verde. They haven't. And, and maybe they want to uh, experience yes. them. They want read to read the like. Greek tragedies. They haven't read Shakespeare. They haven't, you know, so, so it does have something to do with the life cycle of animals, human beings, you know, and, uh, and, 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 but that might change in the future. So what if, you know, everyone becomes, you know, they can live thousands of years. You, eventually, you're going to you're gonna get to know all these things and you've heard it. You know, I think sometimes I think about like what it's like to be a maybe 90 year old man <laughs> and being invited by like your great grandkids to go see like Aquaman, you know, yeah. and then you're like, you know, I get it. You, you think I get it. And, you know, I've sat in movie theaters enough. You know, you, you don't even want to go, probably, you know? It's like, you get it. It's like, it's great. yeah, the storytelling, the movie thing, yeah, neat, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's okay, you know? And but. so I don't know if, like, living a long time is, you know, there might be an optimum, like, you know, 250 years or some, some kind of a... Well, it's funny when people say, like, oh, that music's so old, it's been around for, like, 300 years, and you always ask, well, how long have you been listening to it? <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> you know, I think definitely I, not yeah. 300 See, that, years. That's why I think J.J. is, is concerned about this, is because he's very learned, and he's very... He, he knows the history, you know, and so it concerns him that he sees all these repeating patterns. But, but the general audience is... That's just part of our own inner circle, you know? Uh, the general audience is not keyed into the fact that these are these stories keep coming around and around. What was the one about the bomb? 
um, uh, guy that they, they, he defuses bombs in like Iran or whatever. Oh, is that body oh, locker? locker? Her, her locker. locker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's not much to that either. Not you know, much. it got freaking best picture. That's I think right. you know. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you just gotta you just gotta pick something. You know, it doesn't have to be remarkable, uh, but tell it in an incredibly remarkable and now clever way. Yes, I, I think yes. I would add to that a truthful way because there are a lot of films that present. Um, like not truthful like narratives. authentic. Yeah, either not authentic or it's something that people will not find truthful because they don't experience it and they don't feel it and they may only understand it or even recognize it as truthful in a uh, conscious way, but yes. you know, subconsciously they they don't. So, you know, as a creator, you should always, you know, go after truthful things, find narratives that are true, you know, universal that people can experience and that are like worth knowing about. Yes. And then go after those. I and think express uh, those. I think Cloverfield was a great example. The original uh, mm. was a great example oh, of going yeah. back to something that was like. I mean, he literally had the idea of you know going to Japan and seeing like all the you know Godzilla. Obviously, Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Future, you know, I'm a huge fan of Godzilla as well. Oh yeah, and, me too. Uh, I'll be yeah. huge fan. Cloverfield is so cool because it's like I'll, I always explain it like this. It's like okay, you're watching a Godzilla movie, right? And he's like. Rawr! And he's like breaking he's going through the city and then he walks away and then you're like but what about those fucking people inside the exactly. building you know exactly. and it's like all told from those that person's perspective, perspective. like yes. they're like what the hell was that you know like, that's that feeling of like dread your mystery your yeah. your, your tense like, your brilliant like it was it was it was it was such a great take on it and it was like and there are so many like um, connections you can make from like the original Godzilla from like what 1950 um, there's so many you can right. there's so many you know you're like oh it's, it, it really is I mean he used this, this found footage sort of you know way of telling yeah. it yeah. which I feel I find very interesting too because it oh, was yeah. like that wasn't really done too much like what Blair Witch Project did that that was very big but nobody really jumped on it after that they're like eh it was it was what it is you know it was great for what it yeah, was it, and, it, it, it was a little tacky and it, it seemed to dominate the, uh, it, it, the yeah. uh, at least the, the advertising footage aspect. maybe yeah. he, he relied on that a little too much I mean you go to 2001 Space Odyssey where the whole film was static shots until um, he turns off Hal, and then it's all handheld shots. And it's all handheld. Nobody right. notices it, but you know, I you wonder know, if, so much more if Lost was done. I'd have to check the dates, but if Lost was done, if Blair Witch came before Lost, I'm certain Lost would have started with some footage on a camera that they found. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. If that, uh, yeah. If that idea wasn't, you know, well, or, yeah, kind that of idea doesn't make sense now because you know we we look and say, okay, well, what's the, what's in the metadata of the footage and. Is there oh. cloud backup? Right, right, yeah. yeah that, okay, it's yeah, found, like, but let's go. Oh, let's go yeah. up in his account. Is that on a Google okay, Drive? Yeah, it's right, right here. <laughs> Problem solved. You know, oh, yeah. short mysteries. It's like, very. I true. hope you find this footage, and it's like, uh, <laughs> dude, it's already all over the universe. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I already seen it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I love about the, you know the scene where they had this party, and it was like. What the hell just happened? Like, like something happened. You feel that when I, or at least when I was in the theater, I felt that like terror of like, it seemed like it could have been a, a day like just me being in the city. It wasn't exactly, like exactly. an Independence Day like we're yes. totally like unrealistic. It's like maybe this could have happened. Yes. You know, something's yes. like holy shit. And then you know that's what I like. I, I I was like I really liked it. To maybe not towards the end. I mean there was things, but I. I love the setup, like how they set that thing up. It that's was a, like that's a great example. Now, was, now, how are you yeah. relating that to what JJ was asking there about archetypes? And- oh no, for his archetype, I mean, he he went with that sort of that it, it's a monster movie. I mean, it really and, and you got that, you know, yeah. you're like I understand this is a monster movie, but like right. at the same it was it just I think you brought up one of the best points of it where it's like. You're watching Godzilla. How are those people in those buildings react? How are they dealing? Are they like helping you? Are they trampling each other? What? Right. And then it was. It, it turned into a, a total human element. I mean, obviously the guy's trying to save his girlfriend, or his, you know, his ex, or whatever. You know, trying well, to save I his think girlfriend. I'd have to watch it again, but I think the original Godzilla was yeah. like that. It followed like this little kid. It did. Yeah, it, it was. And his dad, yeah. I think. Yeah, the American release, yeah. the Japanese release. They were, of course, they were different. They actually had. Yeah. I think the American they had a. I can't remember. Yeah, the I'm talking seventies or. Yeah. 60s. Oh, the seventies. Yeah. yeah. Okay, seventies. Yeah. Um, like the very original, though. Yeah, they actually had two different sort of versions. Like the American version was more reliant. It, it was on like, this American character, and uh, they kind of they literally like reshot him and put him into the Japanese film. Um, oh. So they, they the way they cut it, and uh, I have the original Japanese uh, release DVD. You know. And it, it it's follows the scientist who um, pretty much created Godzilla, but then he also <laughs> comes to the one who has to destroy him. He come, mm. comes up with this way of like I think it was like 
this weird bomb he invents where it, you know it, it um, takes all the oxygen out of water, so it just like it, in like a certain area, so the Godzilla's right there, and you see him like turn into a skin. It's very interesting. Wow. Um, hmm. But uh, but no, I think it it honestly it was it was an archetype of like this is a monster movie, but at the same regard, like it's being told in such a more personal way. Um, and I do, I think, I because mean, when I when that when I remember when I first saw the original trailer for that, and you saw like the head of the Statue of Liberty like crash onto the street, I remember everyone was like, it's going to be a new Godzilla movie. And I was like, that would be really cool. I think oh, that'd okay. be it'd be a totally different spin just on like it. Like an American translation yeah. of Godzilla. Yeah, it'd be much, much, hopefully much. Well, that better. was what his intention was. He was. That was I think yeah. that's what. In interviews, he, he said he wanted to create something for Americans. Yes, that would be like as iconic as Godzilla. Exactly. I think it looked kind of like a weird, squishy squid lizard it was thing weird, that I yeah. didn't find too <laughs> endearing, unfortunately. It looked like an eel. I think yeah. that's what you know, and I think I don't know if he understood yeah. that too. He knew, and that's why you yeah. never got a close shot of it. Even yeah. even at the end, like you see its back yeah. when it kind of reaches up. You don't yeah, still yeah. get Ooh. that perfect. You know, the only time it really is even, but like it's it's such a close up shot when it's about yeah. to attack the character with the camera, yeah. you don't really get to see its face. And but apparently, it's part of a larger story, though. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have seen the second or third one. I mean, uh, there third one, second, yeah. no, yeah, the second third one, one was a Cloverfield Paradox. I think it was just a Netflix. Oh, I did see the Paradox. Oh, uh, yeah. okay, I've seen them. They're very loosely based. I've, even the second one, Cloverfield Lane, was written as a completely different film. It wasn't supposed to have any sort of element of Cloverfield yeah. and then I, it somehow they got and hold of the script the Cloverfield. and they're like yeah well we, we can we can kind of tie this in and I think in a way like it's interesting how they did that tr- kind of a trilogy and I, I, I thought it was kind of cool but I think in certain regards too was they kind of tried to reach a little bit too outside to where every story felt very disconnected mm. um, but you still it was like it was it was almost like it was three different movies well, all in the same universe that, but they're not that's, supposed that's to, the bad not, robot style the JJ no. thing is yeah. <laughs> ask questions and never answer never the whole mystery box uh, thing yeah, yeah. Like, even just, when it's over yes yeah. it's over. exactly <laughs> so Jeez. I mean everybody's excited for episode 9 I'm thinking JJ can't end a series so it's gonna push into episode 10 but that's just me that's my prediction actually yeah if he does there's that there's gonna be a surprise episode 10. yeah like said, oh by the way we're not gonna yeah mm. be a quadrilogy instead of a trilogy <laughs> yeah well thank you everybody for coming today and uh, uh, remember to tune in next week and to post your questions and topics we'd love to get into them uh, this discussion here about archetypes and narratives Although it doesn't seem like has what does it have to do with scoring? It, it has a lot to do with scoring. It's it's really what scoring is all about, uh, is telling telling story. And um, if any of you are uh, aspiring composers out there and you want to uh, dive deeper, uh, I do offer a, a private group mentorship that you can uh, come and participate in called the Inside Score. And you're welcome to private message me or, or write in a comment on any of our platforms and we'll uh, connect with you and, and get you in there. And uh, yeah, I think we had a great time this week. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. Please bring your yeah. questions next week and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, guys.